Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India After talking about surfaces in considerable detail, now we take up the topic of interfaces. Interface in general can be between a solid and a liquid, a solid and a vapor or between a solid and a solid. Surface is nothing but a special case of an interface between a solid and or, or a liquid and the vapor phase or the gas phase. Interfaces in general separate two materials. Um, and surfaces of various kinds can be understood as special cases of interfaces. If we want to understand an interface, we can uh, look at it from many points of view. Like if across an interface, the two materials are the same material or a different material. In other words, is it an homophase interface or an heteroface interface? We then talk about the interface in terms of the order inside the interface. And now we are talking about the order in the interface and not in the crystals or the phase bounding the interface. So, interfaces can be ordered or disordered from this perspective. Additionally, we could also talk about the purity of an interface that is if the interface has some material which is segregated from the bulk material surrounding the interface. And typically, it is we have noticed that if a phase or a solute atom is not soluble in any of the grains or the phases separate uh, around the interface then it will segregate to the interface. Then based on the orientation of the bounding crystals, we can talk about special or low angle interfaces or a very general kind of an interface which we can be a have a random misorientation between the two interfaces. We will also consider interfaces based on the terminology which is called coherent, semi coherent or incoherent interfaces. So, this point will become clear when we actually take up uh, a detailed study of coherent, semi coherent and incoherent interfaces. It should be noted that interfaces the ones we are going to consider in this topic are going to be solid solid interfaces. We will not deal with liquid uh, vapor or liquid liquid interfaces in this set of slides or in this set of topics and solid solid interfaces play a very important role in determining the behavior of materials as can be highlighted. Some examples obviously, this is just a illustrative example are for example, we consider hot shortness in iron. When we roll iron with some impurity of sulfur present, then the sulfur can segregate to the grain boundary region and form the FES phase or the iron sulphide phase at the grain boundary. And this can lead to what is known as brittleness during hot rolling conditions because the FES can become a liquid phase and the material will behave as if it is a brittle material because of the segregation. Therefore, we want to avoid sulphur impurity segregating to the interface and it has been noted that this segregation is actually a very small quantities segregation. It is not in large amount that sulphur need to be present before hot shortness is observed. Uh, another nice striking example would be the diffusion of gallium along the grain boundaries of aluminum. If you hold an aluminum polycrystalline material as thin foil and you expose it to a gallium atmosphere by rubbing some gallium on it, then this gallium would tend to diffuse very fast into along the grain boundaries. And if the specimen is held in tension, then this material would fail because gallium is liquid under uh, room temperature or 50, 60 degrees Celsius. Creep is a very important phenomena which leads to quite a bit of engineering failures at high temperatures. And grain boundary sliding is one of the important mechanisms by which uh, creep takes place. And therefore, we can see that from these illustrative examples that interfaces play a very important role in a diverse variety of phenomena. And it as people must have heard of the Hall Petch relationship has a very important bearing coming from the grain boundary which we will study during this uh, study on interfaces. <coughs> 
So, we had noted about various ways of classifying interfaces and we had said that based on order we can classify them as ordered or disordered based on the phase of the bounding grains we can call them homophase or heterophase interfaces and the grain boundary being an homophase interface. Based on the chemistry we noted that an interface can be pure or can have a segregation and this segregation can be a molar layer segregation or a multi layer segregation based on the misorientation of the bounding grains or the bounding crystals we can have special or random interface and special examples of special interfaces include low angle interfaces and coincidence site lattice interfaces. Of course, this being an elementary course we shall not take up many of these uh, concepts like coincidence light lattices in this course. Let us start our discussion of interfaces with the grain boundary. Typically, if I take a piece of aluminum or a piece of a wire of copper, it is a polycrystalline material. This polycrystalline material has single crystalline regions which are bound bonded to one another and the interface between these two crystallites is called a grain boundary. Typically, a grain boundary is considered a two dimensional plane or a two dimensional surface, but the, of course, in reality the grain boundary region can extend a few atomic diameters into either of the bounding crystals. Um, the best way of visualizing a formation of a grain boundary is by considering a crystallization of a melt which we shall do now. Let us now consider solidification from a molten stearic acid and you can see that there is a nucleation of a crystal. There are crystals which are for forming in dendritic form. And when these two crystallites meet, you can see that the region which where the two crystallites touch would be a grain boundary. So, let us play this video again to understand how a grain boundary forms. So, these are crystallites which are growing in various regions of the melt and as pointed out a new crystallite is nucleating here and also growing in dendritic fashion. And when two crystallites touch each other, that region would be a region of the grain boundary atoms at the grain boundary um, belong to neither of the crystals and it actually costs the system to put a grain boundary and therefore, grain boundaries are associated with energy which we can call the grain boundary energy. Uh, the thickness of a grain boundary can be of the order of a few atomic diameters as I pointed out um, in ideal mathematical sense a grain boundary is considered as a two dimensional defect, but in general it can extend to a few atomic diameters on either side of the boundary. At the grain boundary typically the orientation changes abruptly on one side there is a crystal which is oriented in one way on the other side of the grain boundary there is a crystal oriented in different way and therefore, the orientation changes abruptly at the grain boundary. And if you are talking about a very special class of grain boundaries the low angle grain boundaries then the misorientation cost at, at the grain boundary may not be that abrupt and in fact, it will be a more uh, smaller mis uh, more misorientation difference across the grain boundary. And we will soon see that these low angle grain boundaries have a further structure which can be understood in terms of an array of dislocations. The grain boundary energy is an important quantity and this is responsible for instance for the grain growth which takes place when you heat a material typically above about 0.5 tm and in during grain growth the larger grains grow at the expense of smaller grains and you have uh, at the end of the grain growth process an average grain size which is larger than what you started off with. In principle you would note that grain boundaries are not uh, have a differing order than that of either of the bounding grains, but they can have an order of their own and hence uh, grain boundaries are not amorphous in typically, but in very special cases grain boundaries could also be amorphous and we will show see one example of how a grain boundary could even be amorphous, but the important point to note is that in general they are not amorphous. Let us next consider how can I form a grain boundary and obviously, to form a grain boundary I need two crystals of the same kind. And I can assume that one of these crystals is a fixed crystal like the crystal in blue color and I can misorient as a first step the 
other crystal with respect to the first crystal. I can do so by choosing a rotation axis and in general this rotation axis is arbitrary and then I can rotate one crystal with respect to the other and after doing so I can see that the two crystals are not oriented identically and one crystal is misoriented with respect to the other. Having done so then I need to choose a plane which can actually act like the grain boundary. Low angle grain boundaries uh, can spontaneously form during a process known as polygonization which takes place during recovery of a cold work material. Therefore, they have a very important role in materials and as I pointed out it can they can spontaneously form during recovery process. So, let us summarize how this how we can understand this dislocation uh, along the grain boundary. So, we have a triangle here in which we have the Burgers vector which is representative of the strength of the dislocation and depending on the Burgers vector the grain the dislocation energy is determined. Now, these dislocation spacing as we noted keeps on decreasing as you increase the misorientation angle between the two crystals and at some point of time the ind individual independent existence of these dislocations is no longer or identification is no longer possible with increasing misorientation and therefore, we will end up with a scenario what is known as the high angle grain boundary and depending on B when do we actually start seeing high angle grain boundaries is determined as you can see from this equation. Now, this is a nice example of a low angle grain boundary though not a symmetric low angle grain boundary. This material happens to be strontium titanate and the misorientation angle between the two crystallites here or the two grains here is about 8 degrees and the existence of these dislocations along the grain boundary is seen in the image below which is nothing but a Fourier filtered image in which you can see that there are distinct dislocations which are present along the grain boundary. So, we can clearly see in a high resolution lattice using an high resolution lattice fringe image which has been Fourier filtered that a low angle grain boundary consists of an array of dislocations. Another important feature of these presence of these uh, dislocations along low angle grain boundaries and as I pointed out especially why does this arrangement of dislocations along to create a low angle grain boundary take place during polygonization is that the compressive field of one dislocation cancel the tensile field of another dislocations partially and therefore, the such a boundary has no long range stress fields that is all the stress field is localized only to the low uh, grain boundary region unlike an isolated dislocation and this is the motivation for a uh, crystal to actually throw out such kind of low angle grain boundaries during a polygonization process. Now, let us consider how structural dislocation can accommodate linear misfit. So, let us consider a nice example for this which is the growth of silicon germanium uh, some of some composition. So, you can for instance consider a silicon 50 percent germanium 50 percent diamond cubic structure which is grown on a silicon substrate. So, this could be the silicon substrate and this could be the GSI alloy and if you consider silicon it has got a 4.2 lattice parameter misfit with germanium and this alloy itself has a lattice parameter misfit therefore, with the substrate which is silicon. Now, when you epitaxially grow such a film on top of a substrate the film has a tetragonal distortion and is forced to grow when especially as a thin layer on top of the silicon such that the lattice planes are continuous here. So, you can see that in the schematic which is of course, an explanatory schematic that lattice planes are continuous and such a boundary is called a coherent interface or a coherent boundary wherein lattice planes are continuous. Therefore, you have the growth of G S i on top of silicon and such an alloy grows epitaxially putting out a coherent interface, but as the film grows thicker and thicker at some point of time or at some point of time or uh, some thickness of the film the energy stored at the interface or stored in the film is becomes too much and therefore, the interface breaks up into regions which are coherent or actually picking for the whole interface as a semi coherent interface. In other words a coherent interface becomes semi coherent by the presence of a misfit dislocation and this dislocation as you can see the edge dislocation is accommodating linear misfit between the epitaxial film and the substrate. And again we have to note that these interfacial dislocations are very different and characteristic as compared to a bulk dislocation as we had noted before in the case of uh, even a normal material in the case of plasticity. Now, therefore, you could have a coherent interface, you could have a semi coherent interface between G S and S i uh, 
wherein there are interfacial misfit edge dislocations present which are partly relieving the strain between the film and the substrate and you could also think of an interface which is totally incoherent that means there is no matching of planes between the two sides of the interface and therefore such an interface would be an incoherent interface. So, therefore, based on the continuity or coherency we can have a coherent interface, a semi coherent interface or a incoherent interface and we can note clearly here that this dislocation here is slightly different from the grain boundary dislocation because the material above the dislocation and the material below the dislocation slip plane is are different. Therefore, these are heter hetero epitaxial systems that is the materials above and below the interface are different. To summarize this slide therefore, there are structural dislocations which can accommodate linear misfit and such dislocations are like the low angle grain boundary dislocations localized to the interface and here they are performing the role of partly relieving the stresses which are caused because of the lattice mismatch between the GSI alloy and the silicon substrate. And based on coherency you can have coherent interfaces, semi coherent interfaces which have dislocations decorating the interface and in general of course, an incoherent interface. So, the semi coherent interface like in the case of a low angle grain boundary can be thought of as regions wherein you have a dislocation and regions which are regions of good misfit or good good fit which are separated by these dislocations. So, we can have a picture wherein there are planes which are continuous from the substrate to the film like here and there are regions where are dis wherein there are dislocation cores. The grain boundary energy is a function of the misorientation between the two crystals. Of course, suppose you are choosing a misorientation axis like in a tilt boundary to be a say for instance the 110 axis then you would if you were to plot the misorientation angle which is theta here on the x axis with the grain boundary energy which is the y axis you would typically you get, may end up getting a plot which looks like this. The important feature of this plot is that for low angle boundaries the energy is small and we have noticed that this low angle region is a region wherein you can consider the grain boundary to be an array of dislocations. Then for normal high angle grain boundaries you would notice that the energy is pretty high, but between these high energy misorientations there are cusps in the grain boundary versus misorientation plot that there are some special boundaries which have a low energy. Typically such kind of boundaries arise when you have some a concept known as coincidence site lattice model of grain boundaries. This being an elementary course we are not going to the detail of what is a coincidence site lattice or how this coincidence site lattice is going to give rise to low energy, but it is important to note that the um, like we had noted for the case of the low angle grain boundary that with increasing misorientation the energy of the boundary is going to change. So, it is true for even for high angle grain boundaries, but the variation is not a monotonic function. In other words, the variation in energy of the system as a function of the grain boundary misorientation and could show a function which looks like the plot shown here which could have cusps which correspond to special boundaries. So, we could in general classify two kinds of special boundaries those having which correspond to these cusps and those having low angle. Therefore, you can have low angle grain boundaries which are special boundaries and those high angle grain boundaries which could also have relatively lower energy which we can which can be then corresponded to something known as the coincidence site lattice concept. But as we noted this grain boundary energy is a very important quantity in the behavior of the material because now this is going to determine how much segregation is going to occur or how much of for instance grain growth or how fast the grain growth will occur during an annealing or high temperature hold process. As I had pointed out before suppose you were to talk to um, uh, material scientists in the early days that is much much before some of the models of these grain boundaries arose. Uh, a mental picture which is often carried by many people is that grain boundary is a region of disorder and we are as we had noted by looking at some of the grain boundaries so far that often it is not true and often there could be an order in the grain boundary. Of course, this order could be very different from the order present in the bulk of the crystal, but there are special cases wherein you would find actually that the grain boundary region is actually totally amorphous or it is glassy ok. And such an example is shown in the high resolution lattice fringe image which is in the micrograph as below 
So, this micrograph below shows a green boundary in silicon nitride between two this so green there is a green one of silicon nitride above and there is a green two of silicon nitride above and these are these the these fringes correspond to lattice planes in these two crystallites, but the important thing to focus here is the green boundary region and you would notice that the green boundary region is glassy or amorphous. So, you have an amorphous region at the green boundary, but it is to be noted this occurs only in very special cases as in this case this is a silicon uh, green boundary in silicon nitride such kind of uh, amorphous grain boundaries can also found in other special system like silicon carbide, strontium titanate and alumina. But if you take a general grain boundary in aluminum or copper, you would not typically find this kind of an amorphous grain boundary. And to summarize this slide, though most grain boundaries can have a very good order in them, there are possibilities of having grain boundaries which have an disordered and amorphous layer and these examples can be found for instance in silicon nitride or strontium titanate wherein you have a thin layer of course, this layer is of the order of a nanometer or 1 to 2 nanometers which is an amorphous region and the grain mount region itself is totally amorphous or near uh, not does not have crystalline order as in the side of the crystal. The next two dimensional interface we consider is the twin boundary. The twin boundary is a very special kind of a boundary which is in very in some sense a very very regular kind of a boundary as compared to any of the other defects in a material or the any, any of the other two dimensional defects in a material. The atomic arrangement on one side of a twin boundary is related to the other side by a symmetry operation. This symmetry operation is typically a mirror and therefore, you have something known as a mirror twin boundary or the mirror twin, but in addition you could also have inversion twins and rotation twins. So, we will take up one example at least of a mirror twin and also of a rotation twin during the course of these uh, lectures. It is obvious that the symmetry operator defining the twin itself cannot be a symmetry operator of the crystal because if it is a symmetry operator of the crystal, the crystal actually will continue across the interface and therefore, we will have no distinct boundary and therefore, we can have no twin. That means that the symmetry operator for instance the mirror cannot be a mirror plane of the crystal. That means, it is not one of the existing symmetry operators of the crystal and it has to be the mirror plane has to be different from the symmetry operators of the crystal. It has been often noted and we will see this using a mi micrograph that twin boundaries typically occurs in pairs and the orientation difference created by one twin boundary is restored by the other. The region between the twin boundaries is called a twin region or a twin. Therefore, you have a twin and the bounding surfaces of the twin are called twin boundaries. We had earlier noted when defining a crystal that a crystal can be defined with respect to a geometrical entity, a physical property or a combination of both. Therefore, when you are talking about a twin which is now again a concept which invokes symmetry therefore, like the crystal therefore, you could have a twin boundary a mirror twin for example, which could be reflecting a physical property or which could be reflecting atomic positions. Therefore, you could have a twin boundary which is with respect to a geometrical entity or a physical property or in very special cases we can even visualize a twin boundary which is with respect to both the geometrical entity and the physical property. Now, two or more crystallites related by the symmetry operator are called variants of the twin. Now, the importance of twinning becomes very very uh, obvious especially when we are talking about plastic deformation or permanent deformation. We have noted that one of the most important vehicles of plastic deformation is the dislocation, but there could be systems wherein uh, plasticity by slip or by the motion of dislocations is limited. This could be for instance BCC crystals at low temperature and in such materials twinning becomes an important mechanism by which plastic deformation or permanent deformation is achieved. Therefore, twinning is not only an important structural defect from the point of view of its association with symmetry, but it can play a very important role in plastic deformation especially in systems wherein slip is limited or wherein the strain rates are very high. Therefore, materials wherein slip is limited twinning can accommodate some amount of plastic deformation. To summarize this slide once more a twin can be with respect to a geometrical entity or a physical property and one side of a twin 
boundary is related to the other side of a twin boundary by a symmetry operation which is not the symmetry operation of the crystal and this symmetry operation could be typically a mirror, but it could also be an inversion or a rotation. So, let us first jump and see an actual micrograph wherein you have some twins therefore, for instance this region within the crystal. So, this is a grain which you can see here. So, let me so this is my grain here and within this grain you can clearly see there are two boundaries the region between these two boundaries is the twin boundary and the, since these are two dimensional interfaces this plane actually extends into the slide. So, you have twin, two twin boundaries one introduces a misorientation which is cancelled by the other, the other and the region between the two twin boundaries is the twin we are talking about. If this is a sample which is nothing but cold work and recrystallized copper wherein you can see there are a lot of twins in the structure. The, so, let us go back and try to understand that what kind of twins are possible as we had pointed out before twins can be mirror twins, rotational twins or inversion twins. Twinning can be with respect to a physical property or a geometrical entity. Additionally, by the process by which twins are created also twinning can be classified. Twins can be created during annealing like we had seen in the case below of uh, cold work copper, but twins also can be created by deformation which I told were the twins which accommodate plasticity. Therefore, you can have annealing twins which are created during recrystallization or you can have deformation twins which are created during plastic deformation of a material. Typically, twins are observed or twinning pro is more observed in a material wherein the stacking fault energy is small and we will soon see why that such a criteria is important. For instance, I was pointing out that actually you can have a mirror twin wherein a physical property could be reflected and for instance, this is my twin plane or the mirror plane and this is a crude schematic showing how a physical property like a magnetization vector can be reflected across the interface. But more commonly we are talking about twins wherein you have a geometrical entity like a for atomic position which is reflected and therefore, you can see an image below wherein you can see that there is a twin plane which passes through the middle and the atoms across the plane are reflected by this mirror plane. Therefore, if you have an atom here you would have an atom corresponding to that which is reflected in the atomic plane a mirror you have an atom here and an atom here. Therefore, you can see that atomic planes are also reflected by this mirror. So, this is a twin plane and these two are the two variants of the twin which we had talked about. One of the important things which will be start uh, uh, striking or when you look at a boundary like this is that unlike the grain boundary which we saw is curling and going across the material in a very uh, random fashion the twin boundaries are very straight and sharp. In fact, the straight fact can easily be seen from an optical micrograph as here, but the uh, to notice actually that the they are atomically sharp you need to go into an high resolution lattice fringe image with atomic resolution, but you would notice that that if you took such an image that the twin boundary is atomically sharp. So, this is one of the rare examples of a boundary which is not only straight, but it is also atomically sharp. So, unlike the grain boundary which uh, could have a certain region around it which uh, could even as we saw in the extreme example be amorphous and typical grain boundaries are not straight. The twin boundary is a very special kind of a boundary which can be atomically sharp and actually can be very very straight. As I told you that twins can be created by other symmetry operations like the rotation and in this figure we see that how a rotation twin is created. In this rotation twin we have 5 variants. So, we can label these 5 uh, number these 5 variants as the first variant, the second variant, the third variant, the fourth variant and the fifth variant. Therefore, there are 5 variants and if you think of an rotation axis which passes through the center of this figure then you can think of one crystal rotated with respect to the other crystal and the rotation is approximately 72 degrees. If you actually in real crystals you will find that the uh, and studies have been done on nano crystalline copper or twinning in diamond films the angle is close to 72 degrees, but rarely at exactly at 72 degrees, but the important thing to note that actually you can see that one crystal is rotated with respect to the other and this rotation is carried forward 5 times to create the 5 variants which are the 5 variants of the crystal. And if one were to take what is known as a selected area diffraction pattern from a region around the center 
you will actually observe a 5 fold symmetry. It is as if this twin variant mimics an higher symmetry because the crystal itself does not have 5 fold symmetry, but the combination of these 5 variants of the twin can mimic an higher symmetry which in this case can be a 5 fold symmetry. Therefore, you can have reflection twins as in the example we considered before wherein there is a mirror plane and there is a reflection of atomic position, but in addition to that we can also have a rotation twin wherein one variant is rotated with respect to the other by a rotation operation and as before that rotation operation should not be inherent to the crystallite otherwise we will land up with a single crystal and not with 5 variants. Next we come to another class of defects which is known as the stacking fault. We had noted before that how we can understand the structure of uh, the cubic close pack structure and also the hexagonal close pack structure as a stacking of hexagonal planes which finally lead to what we may call the close packing or the closest packing which is about 74 percent atomic packing fraction. Now, it could be so that in an and we had noted that for instance in an FCC or a cubic close pack crystal the stacking sequence is ABC, ABC, ABC and for an similarly for an HCP crystal it will be AB, AB, AB. It could so happen that during crystal growth there could be actually a defect introduced when the stacking sequence is disturbed for whatever reason. Now, for instance you had a perfect crystal which is ABC, ABC, ABC and obviously that stacking direction being the 1, 1, 1 direction of the cubic close pack crystal. So, it could so happen that when you are talking about a defected crystal that you have an ABC, ABC packing, but suddenly some region there is an AB, AB packing. This is created if an layer which originally had to be a C layer shifted in such a way that it now behaves like a C A layer. Therefore, you have a region in the crystal or in this uh, which looks like an HCP locally. Therefore, the packing sequence of ABC, ABC is disturbed and there is one layer in between which originally should have been a C layer, but which is shifted with respect to the its original expected position and therefore, it is sitting in a position which therefore, can be called a A layer and therefore, locally you have a region which is an AB, AB packing which is like an HCP stacking. This fault in stacking is called a stacking fault and is often found in materials which have low stacking fault energy like for instance in uh, the important point to note when you are talking about stacking faults is that the region the second nearest neighbors are not disturbed it is the nearest neighbors which are disturbed. Therefore, in materials where the interactions of second order are not that strong it is more observed that you will actually produce a stacking fault. This is very similar in some sense to the twinning which we had considered that actually then it is the nearest neighbors are perfectly ordered. So, this nearest neighbor this nearest is perfectly ordered it is only the next nearest neighbor the one which is we have to go one further. So, if I were to label these atoms is 1, 2, 3 then 1 and 2 are as expected, but 1 and 3 are not as, as expected. If 3 were in the right position with respect to this crystal 1 then it should have actually continued and it should have been expected to be here, but it is not there and therefore, you have a shift that means that the second nearest neighbor uh, coordination has been affected which is very similar to the case of the stacking fault wherein again the second nearest neighbor coordination is affected. So, materials wherein the second nearest neighbor coordination is not a contributing too much to the energy you can have a stacking fault energy and typical stacking fault energies come in the value of 0.01 to 0.05 joules per meter square. And if you were here talking about a stacking fault in a cubic close pack crystal leading to a small region which is similar to an HCP crystal the converse is true for when you are talking about stacking fault in an HCP crystal in which case uh, the stacking fault in an HCP crystal can lead to a thin region which is having a packing which you would expect for a cubic close pack crystal. Now, um, if you are talking about uh, a crystal wherein you are expecting uh, a thin region which is of HCP type these two this region can be thought of as bound by two partial dislocations in an SV crystal and we had noted before that these are called the Shockley partial dislocations. To summarize stacking fault is a two dimensional defect 
which can be thought of as a fault in the stacking sequence in a close pack crystal. So, if you had an ABC, ABC, ABC sequence which would give you a perfect cubic close pack crystal when you are looking along the 1 1 1 direction. Now, if you had a region wherein the expected C position is shifted and you have an A position, then you have a region which looks like an HCP crystal and this HCP region can be thought of as bounded by two partial dislocations which are known as the Shockley partial dislocations and such an material in which you often find stacking faults are re, uh, materials wherein you have uh, low stacking fault energy which is nothing but the second order interactions being weaker as compared to the first order interactions. So, a stacking fault in an a cubic close pack crystals is a small region which looks like an HCP crystal and a vice versa that uh, in an HCP crystal you can think of a stacking fault being a region wherein you have a cubic close pack kind of an occurrence. Now, we have talked about various defects for instance we have talked about the surface, we have talked about the green boundary, we have talked about the twin boundary and finally, we now talked about the stacking fault which we all consider to be two dimensional defects and we were very clear that when we are talking about two dimensional defects we said that even though it is not it is not geometrically two dimensional that it is not uh, localized to just a plane, but often the disturbance and the effect of the interface is could be a few atomic diameters especially for the grain boundary, but in some cases it could be very atomically sharp and the disturbances are very localized to the interface like in the case of a twin boundary, but an important exercise is to see the comparative or the relative energies of all these boundaries and it is clear and the ones which are highlighted for instance here we have a list in which you have certain FCC crystals and also a BCC crystal you note that typically the surface energy is the highest because you are actually cutting all the bonds above the plane and therefore, it is costing a lot of energy to the surface or to create a surface and we are again to reiterate that the energies we are talking about are with respect to the perfect crystal they are positive energies and not with respect to isolated atoms that means, they, they might be lower in energy as compared to an isolated atoms, but the state of energy of an surface or any of the interfaces is higher with respect to the perfect crystal. A grain boundary on the other hand we are noted is that for instance in an FCC crystal the coordination number around the grain boundary will not be 12 it will be smaller and therefore, it is an higher energy, but definitely a lower energy as compared to the surface energy and you can note that for gold for instance it is about 1370 joule per meter square to put a surface, it is about 360 joules per meter square to put a grain boundary and the twin boundary energy and like the stacking fault energy are smaller values as compared to the grain boundary or the surface energy and this trend can be repeatedly seen here that the surface energy is high for platinum, grain boundary energy is somewhere intermediate while the twin boundary is lower in energy. For aluminum again the surface energy is very high, the grain boundary energy is uh, somewhere intermediate while the twin boundary energy is small. Okay. When you are looking at the stacking fault energies, if you compare for instance copper and aluminum you notice that aluminum has a high stacking fault energy while copper has a low stacking fault energy. In other words if you want to talk use a different language in aluminum a regular dislocation has find will find it difficult to split into par Shockley partials because if it per splits into Shockley partials it will produce a stacking fault and it costs a lot of energy to put a stacking fault. Therefore, in aluminum uh, perfect dislocations will tend to remain perfect dislocations and would not tend to split into Shockley partials while in a material like copper you would find that there is a higher density of stacking faults and uh, full dislocation would tend to split into partial dislocations. Therefore, to summarize the concept of 2D defects and to compare their energies let us go back to the starting point of these interfaces. We talked about the most general word is an interface can connect any kind of two materials it can be between a gas and a solid it could be between a solid and a solid or it could be between a liquid and a solid but the most important one we are concerned for now in this set of lectures in the structure of materials lectures is the one between two solids. Uh, surface is the one which we had considered before which is between a gas or a vacuum and a solid. So, the interfaces we are talking about here are typically between two solids. We had noted that we can actually classify interfaces based on various many methods it could be based on the bonding order based on the orientation of the grains or the misorientation between the two sides of the uh, interface it could be based on chemistry or it could be based on the kind of phase which is present or around the interface. 
The most important of this slot is the green boundary and we had noted like all the other interfaces that green boundary is associated with an energy which is responsible for many many physical phenomena including segregation and green growth. And we have to note that we had also noted how to create a green boundary by using macroscopic methods like misorientation, cuts and also how we work at the unit cell level to actually make the grain boundary or shift one crystal with respect to the other and therefore, at the unit cell level we are worried about actual atoms which are going to sit at the surface. For instance, in a sodium chloride you could have a polar surface which has only for instance, chlorine atoms or sodium atoms and similarly in an ordered structure you could have a surface which is of one kind of an atom or another kind of an atom. So, we noted that typically grain boundaries um, could be uh, uh, they are not straight they are uh, you know curving, but in special cases you could also have straight grain boundaries and we had noted that very special cases of grain boundaries are what are called the low angle grain boundaries, which can be thought of as an array of dislocations like in the case here. And we had noted that these low angle grain boundaries have no long range stress fields unlike a single dislocation and as the misorientation angle increases the spacing between the dislocations tend to decrease they tend to go towards each other. Further, we had noted that uh, these there is other class of a uh, uh, interface wherein you have to invoke the concept of a structural dislocation, which is the case of an heteroepitaxial interface, wh which becomes, for instance, during epitaxial growth, you have these semi coherent uh, coherent interface becoming semi coherent with the formation of a misfit segment of a dislocation, which is, as we pointed out, a very different kind of a dislocation as compared to the statistically stored dislocation. And the reason that this strategy works is that the crystal is now split into regions which are having good fit and regions which have bad fit which are around the cores of the dislocation. We had also noted that the grain boundary energy is not a constant it depends on the misorientation angle and the misorientation versus energy again actually is not a monotonic function and actually can have can be a very sharply varying function with cusps. We had noted that these cusps like the low angle grain boundary correspond are special boundaries and they are treated separately. We also noted another class of a special boundary which we can call the uh, amorphous boundary which is found only in very selected systems. So, in other words if I take a green boundary in copper or take a green boundary in some of the materials uh, like titanium or some of the alloys the, or a NIAL ordered structure you would not find any glassy film along the grain boundary because the grain boundary would be actually pretty ordered. But in these very special materials you can actually have a region of the grain boundary which is amorphous or glassy. We also talked about the twin boundary and the important thing we said about the twin boundary is that there are two variants of a twin which are connected by a symmetry operation which is not an inherent symmetry operation of either of the crystals. And we can have twins which are mirror twins, rotation twins, inversion twins and we had also noted that twinning can also play a very important role in plasticity especially in materials wherein plasticity by slip is severely limited. Therefore, we can have annealing twins which are produced during recrystallization or we can have twins which is produced during plastic deformation. So, this was a typical example of an annealing twin which is produced in recrystallized copper. We could also we also saw an example of a rotation twin and we had noted that an rotation twin can mimic an higher symmetry which is not present in the individual variant. Finally, we had considered stacking fault and we noted that the stacking fault energy is typically lower than the um, for instance the surface energy or the grain boundary energy and we had noted that the stacking fault is a concept which we invoked for close pack crystals. Finally, while making a comparison we said that the surface energy is typically higher than the grain boundary energy which is typically higher than the twin boundary or the stacking fault energy.